Uh, do we know if all the board members have made it into our meeting? I don't think everybody has, Scott. I'm looking around. I'm trying to make you guys all co-hosts. Um, I see a Gary. I'm assuming that's our Gary. See Debbie and Brian. Yep, I've got them in as co-hosts. Uh, I think I saw Todd come in. So he, oh, wrong one. Cliff is present in the boardroom. I believe Cassie was going to come down to the district office and sit in the boardroom as well. Gary, are you able to unmute yourself now? Yes, I can. Hey, good. So I've got Debbie Brownell, Gary Richardson, Scott Nelson, Brandy LaGrange, Kirk Kolb, you're as a co-host. Todd, you're as a co-host. I don't see Cassie yet. Prince Pass School District. How about Cliff? I see Cliff. Cliff and Cassie are present. Is that under the Grants Pass SD? Yes. Okay. They are now co hosting, so they should be able to talk. Me and my board packet. Yep, I can hear them. All right, well, I think all the board members have made it in from our last meeting, so welcome. We will call our uh, Grants Pass District uh, 7 School Board meeting to order, and we will begin with our Pledge of Allegiance. So if you will join me, uh, you may stand or sit, I guess, but we encourage you to stand and we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, 2.0, communications and presentations. Do we have any written communications, Superintendent Cole? No written communications at this time. Okay. Uh, for those who are joining us, if you'd uh, like to speak uh, to an action item on our agenda this evening. We invite you to put it in the chat and uh, Dr. Bloomquist will be monitoring that and will then um, let us know when it comes to the appropriate point in our meeting. Yep. So. so I'm gonna add some clarification to that. There is a Google form in the chat, which you need to fill out. And then Dr. Bloomquist will queue you up when that agenda or action item arises. Okay, thank you. So go to 2.3, our financial report. As presented in the path packet, both the financial report and the personnel report. Okay. Um, well, then let's go on to our consent agenda. So we um, need to approve our consent agenda. The first will be uh, tonight's board meeting agenda, September 14th, as well as the approval of our board draft minutes from August 24th, 2021. So I will entertain a motion to approve that from our board members. Chair Nelson. Yes. I would. Uh... Move that the agenda is modified to add an item at between 3.0 and 4.0 for the board to decide if a PL of the pre-termination hearing is allowed. 
I will second that. Member Wilkins. Sorry. What's the motion again, please? To modify the agenda. Yes. In what way? Jerry. To add an item for the board to decide if appeal of the pre-termination hearing is allowed. Oh, okay. I'm going to add some clarification to that. That is tied directly to executive session litigation, uh, at which time legal counsel will be uh, uh, consulting on that as board chair Nelson and I have been uh, working on that. Um, well, so I don't know what the litigation item is in executive session, but the item I'm asking for isn't an executive session item. It's just a question of whether the board's going to uh, allow an appeal of the pre-termination hearing. Gary, I believe that's what is being discussed in our executive session this evening. We have asked the attorneys to come in and instruct and educate the board on the proper process and procedure for that. So, I'm, But what I'm saying is that's not an executive session item. Um, I thought that's what was on the agenda at the bottom. I can't scroll down on my screen, but it does talk about the, um, thank you, the litigation, and that is part of that. Well, this, this item is not a litigation item. Um, well, God, I guess um, uh, after consulting with Jim Green, um, that motion would be considered out of order based on Robert's rules of order. Um, and so uh, reconsideration of any prior uh, action by the board needs to have taken place immediately following that board meeting. Um, and so that's the clarification regarding that. Yeah, th <clears throat> this is not a reconsideration uh, according to Robert's rules of order. This is just a question of whether the board's gonna allow an appeal from the superintendent based on our policies. We, we have a policy that states that's the way it works. This is, mem this is member Brownell. Didn't um, we get advice uh, at a previous um, board meeting about adding things to agendas without 24 hour notice to the media? Um, and I don't wanna be a part of that. Uh, we're, we are, there's no issue with us adjusting our agenda at the beginning of the meeting. Well, Gary, I guess what I would say is we have uh, placed clarification from the attorneys during our executive session so that the board can be better educated. So um, might I recommend that we defer until we, after we've listened to what they have to say, um, and then we can discuss whether or not that's an appropriate agenda item for us moving forward. Well, there's a motion on the floor. Needs a vote. And a second. Sure, is there any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, uh, that motion has been made and seconded. So we can call for a roll call vote. Tanya, would you please start with that? Member Delagrange? No. Member Neville? Yes. Member Wilkins? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Brownell? No. Board Chair Nelson? No. Member Coleman? Yes. Okay. Thank you. The motion carries four to three. So Todd, if we could scroll back up. So we are still in need of approving our uh, other agenda items, so 3.1 and 3.2. So with the modification, we have a motion to approve our agendas and our agenda minutes. I move that we approve the consent agenda as amended. Second that motion, Member Neville. Okay, any further discussion? So 
If we vote no, um, we can't move forward. Is that correct? Uh, I believe we move forward if there is a majority vote. Mm -hmm. So we can vote again, Debbie. I suspect the votes will be unchanged. It will likely be four to three. Um, so any further discussion on our agenda items? Okay, so it's been moved uh, and seconded for approval with our um, modifications. Can we have a roll call vote, please, Tanya? Member De La Grange? No. Member Neville? Yes. Member Wilkins? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Brownell? No. Member Nelson? No. Member Coleman? Yes. Okay. Uh, moving forward then, our agenda item 3.0A. Gary, I'll turn the time over to you for your question. Well, I will just put a motion to the board. I move that the board allow an appeal of the superintendent's decision to the board. So uh, clarification there, uh, the board already voted on the superintendent's recommendation. So would it be an appeal to the board about the board's vote? No, the, the hearing you're referring to was a pre-termination hearing for the superintendent. And we have the legal advice and the emails from you saying that after that occurred, there could be an appeal to the board under our policies. So under policy, there was a hearing with the board. The policy does not reference an appeal. There was a hearing with the board based on the superintendent's recommendation. That hearing, according to legal counsel, has already been heard by the board and the board took a vote. Well, that must be, that's a different interpretation of what occurred. Hence, uh, hence the executive session litigation item. Well, at the moment, I proposed a motion, but there, unless there's a second. Oh, I second that to follow policy KL. So again, I would just encourage the board to consider that we have, we have a number of items that will be discussed in our executive session with the attorneys to discuss what the proper procedure is and what the policy states. And I would recommend that we wait until after we meet with them before we jump to any conclusions or make a vote. I think that that would be an inappropriate way for us to proceed. So um, there is nothing that says we can't come back out of executive session and reopen the meeting if we wanted to hold this discussion later. But I think voting on something that we don't have clear um, well, that we don't have clarification for is inappropriate, so. We've been given legal advice many times and we were told that there was an appeal under our policies, but part of our policies says that the board has to decide, we don't have to accept the appeal. So it's the board's decision as to whether they accept an appeal from the superintendent's action. So we can take the vote now saying that we're going to allow an appeal and should something change in executive session, we could always reconsider after executive session. Or we could just wait and then vote after executive session. Excuse me, but it sounds like Gary has been talking to lawyers and getting advice that I haven't been getting. And I really um, do not like to have to vote on something um, without that information. 
email. I don't think I have any legal advice that you don't have. These are all in emails that we received or from meetings we attended. Um, well, your memory is different than mine on some of these items, and I um, am not happy with this procedure and feel it's out of order. So there is updated legal uh, guidance uh, from multiple uh, different legal counsel uh, that both represents the board and the district slated for the executive session. So Gary, proceeding at this point in time is inappropriate. It places the board in an awkward position without having more information. And I think the appropriate thing to do would be to withdraw your motion, allow us to have a discussion in executive session so that we can have further clarification. And then we can come back after executive session, reopen our meeting and then discuss and vote if we feel that's appropriate. But I agree with Debbie moving forward without further information from the board and just voting on something while we have information coming. Um, it's just, it's not the right way to handle something like this. So I suspect if people will not, if they're gonna vote the same way, it won't matter, but at least we have better understanding of what we're doing. So I would appeal to you um, to withdraw your motion, wait until after we've had a chance to discuss this in executive session, and then we can come back and discuss it in open session and make a vote. Well, I like to hear from some other board members, how they feel. This is member De Lagrange. Um, I feel it's unwise to move forward before we get the information in executive session. Um, Gary's proposition of making a decision and then hearing and then changing it is not, it opens us up to risk and it's not the most streamlined option. So, you know, if the result's gonna be the same at the end of the meeting, it'd be nice to have, you know, the legal advice from counsel before we um, muddy the water. Debbie, speaking to what you were saying about not having the information, there was an email on July 28th that did go over, um, and, and it does say policy KLAR that we must hold, a, or that yes, it does appear strange that the school board must vote to dismiss or not, and also must hold a full post dismissal hearing with witnesses called by both sides. And so we, we have had legal, this is from our legal counsel, and we have had legal advice on this subject. And I think it's important to know that that advice has significantly been updated. Well, <laughs> you know what? It comes down to trust. I don't trust Gary as a lawyer. I would rather hear from the real lawyers. That was from our real lawyer. Uh, Gary um, and everybody, this is member De Lagrange. This is akin to, you know, jumping into the river without knowing how deep the water is. Um, and I would surely like to know how deep the water is before I jump in. Well, it's always, you can always say that, well, we need more information, but we've had a lot of information through this whole process. I mean, it essentially consumed the board from March till June. And we had, I don't even know how many sessions with attorneys and Cassie just read part of it, which said, you know, we specifically ask, how does this play out? And we're told there is an appeal to the board under our policies. The meeting, the pre-termination that we had was to satisfy some OA, ORS that uh, the attorneys were talking about. So this is a essentially simple procedural deal that we're saying we're following the policy and we're gonna allow the appeal. 
Well, I would just say that it may be simple for some. I think some of us may have other questions and out of respect for your fellow board members waiting another hour and a half before we vote on this and having a discussion in executive session is I think just a professional courtesy to your other board members. So again, I would ask that you withdraw your motion so that we could do this at a different point later tonight would be fine, but waiting two more hours isn't going to make that much of a difference. I believe there is a second. All right, any further discussion? Todd, anything um, else you wanted to add, Debbie? Okay, so now I'm trying to read the email chain from July 28th referenced earlier, and I do not come to the same conclusions as Gary does rereading re these. I, and I feel this has not been talked about in a board meeting. I don't think it's um, appropriate to be discussing this right now before we talk to lawyers. Member De LaGrange would also add that a couple months ago, we had a similar situation where Gary wanted to modify the agenda and we did not modify the agenda because of the 24 hour notice requirement. And so we have already done that now. So we're already kind of you know, outside of where we should be. And I just think it's extremely unwise to make a vote on this before we um, hear from legal counsel. Uh, Todd, anything? Cliff, we haven't heard from you. Do you have anything else to say? Uh, no, I, I will simply say that I'm very much in favor of an appeal uh, on behalf of the two teachers uh, they have a right to an appeal, I understand, and I've understood that from the very beginning. I don't think this has ever changed from the very beginning. There was some confusion on what you call that, whether it's a post-termination hearing or an appeal. I don't care what you call it, but these ladies deserve an appeal, and I'm voting for it. I don't care if you do it now or later in the meeting. I will add my understanding as well from the beginning of time for me, which has only been two months ago, but I understand that there was a process for post for post dismissal hearing or an appeal. For me, it's a matter of saying tomatoes or tomatoes. They're one and the same. And I think that's part of the due process here that we are trying to get at. Okay, anybody else have any other comments then from the board? Well, I don't, yeah, this is member DeLagrange. I don't know if Cliff and Todd are clear, but nothing I'm saying is, you know, I don't want to sweep this under the rug. I just want to talk about it after we hear from legal counsel. It seems the prudent thing to do. And that is tonight, that is happening in this meeting. So I don't understand why it's being pushed through before executive session. And I, I appreciate your comments, Brian, I do. Um, I think we've had time to discuss this prior with all of us present, with attorneys present as well. And I think we have enough information to vote on, but uh, Gary, Cassie, anything else worth considering here? Well, we, we talked about at last meeting that we'd have an agenda item for it. Uh, partially, this has come about because there's nothing in the agenda that was sent out to me that told me that the litigation was related to the board appeal. So, I mean, that's why we are where we are. So now, now you're aware, Gary. I know, but we tried to do it last meeting and sort of we delayed because we weren't sure we were allowed to do it at that point in the meeting. But this time, we're sure we've done it appropriately 
And so that's why we put it on the agenda. And essentially it is on the agenda. Scott and I heard, I re-listened to the last board meeting, consulted with Jim Green from OSBA, uh, our new legal counsel, as well as PACE counsel. Um, and hence uh, this hearing discussion has a direct impact on litigation uh, and essential that uh, the board hear that from legal counsel, new legal counsel, as well as PACE legal counsel pending litigation, uh, that uh, guidance. And so now that you're aware that exists on this agenda in executive session, um, Dr. Nelson and I who have set the agenda have attempted to honor that. All right, well, hearing no other comments, we do have a motion and it's been seconded. Um, and so it is with reluctance and maybe even some prejudice that this is the inappropriate thing to do, but we will follow Robert's rules of order. So Tanya, I will have you uh, give us a roll call vote, please. Tanya, I believe you're muted. looking for her login. Off. You're kicked off? It's just spinning now. Got it connected. Should I go out, go back in? Go out and come back in again, yeah. Technical difficulties, we'll get this yeah. result here in just a moment. Looks like Tanya's link got lost, so she's gonna try to log back in again. Can okay. I ask a question of clarification? Yes. So did the proposers of this um, motion make an effort to contact the board chair or superintendent to inquire as to if this was on the agenda in its current form? Or is this being sprung on everybody by surprise? I was surprised that it wasn't on the agenda. But you received the agenda a number of days ago and didn't say anything? No. I don't see her coming back in. I'm trying to see where she is. Who, this is member Wilkins. Who is she? We had a hiccup on our. Looking for Tanya, <laughs> she can call the roll. If you're close to her, you, that'll work. I'm here, we were here. Go for it. So we're calling the roll. We have a motion and a second. We needed a roll call vote, please. Member Delagrange? No. Member Neville? Yes. Member Wilkins? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. 
Member Brownell? No. Member Nelson? No. We need Member Coleman too. Member Coleman? Yes. Okay, we will move on to point zero, our reports. So a student organization, we will turn the time over to whoever is presenting. Me. <laughs> I think you can hear me, correct? We can, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we last board meeting had a policy on the board agenda and wanting to get you guys some more information also made some edits to the board policy based on some board member feedback. Uh, I'm joined tonight by Principal Ryan Thompson from Grants Pass High School, Principal Tommy Blanchard from North Middle School and Principal Robert Lingo from South Middle School. So we'll be tag teaming a little bit. I'm going to ask Todd to please share the um, student organization guidelines with you on the webinar here. Thank you. Um, we so I want to take you back uh, a, a time ago when we were doing our community input sessions around student investment account from our students to our parents uh, to our staff we heard very clearly we wanted more opportunities for students to be engaged in their school with activities, clubs, organizations. And as we geared up for, you know, COVID kind of set us back a little bit um, on the development of these things. And as we're coming back to in-person, we started some activity bus runs after school to provide additional opportunities and remove barriers for students to participate in things like athletics. We're also looking to do that for our clubs and organizations. Wanting to, um, in that process of wanting to start, see more clubs, more organizations started at our schools, um, revisited our guidelines um, and our board policy and really needed to do some updating. So what we have here for you today, you, you saw the policy last time. And today you have in front of you our guidelines and some additional information that we'll be sharing with you. So I'll start it off with, there's basically two types of clubs. And we, we looked at models across the state. A lot of different districts have these types of guidelines in place. So we were able to model after what uh, others have done before us. We also used OSBA policy um, and looked at other district board policies related to student organizations and worked to develop these guidelines. We've had several team meetings and a number of board member input on it as well. So the two types of clubs are referred to in the policy. One is curriculum related and one is voluntary, voluntary student organized. And the difference really there, and, and when we actually give you some examples of clubs, you'll start to get a sense of the difference there. Um, our curriculum related ones are obviously directly tied to curriculum. Uh, a good example of that would be our math team. Um, our math students participate in a club where they go and compete at competitions and, and such. And that would be obviously a really uh, good example of a curriculum tied one. Over the years, our students have wanted to organize activities that would pull them together. A good example of that would be chess club. Um, there's a number of chess clubs. It, it would be difficult to make that curriculum tie. I mean, you could uh, if you really wanted to, but that's really the difference between a curriculum related and a voluntary student organized. Um, in this process, we've wanted to develop some more accountability for student clubs, uh, wanting them to report to our student leadership that we have at all of our secondary schools, and then of course approved and monitored by administration. And so the guidelines, if you scroll down, Todd, we'll start talking about how club organizations are formed and the processes. And I'm going to turn it over to Ryan, who's going to speak to that. Todd, can you scroll a little bit for us, please? Thank you, Trish. Uh, first step with the clubs in terms of how those are formed, those evolve over time. We have some long-standing clubs that have been with us for um, decades 
We have others that are, are quite new, and every year we tend to have, uh, at least at the high school level, a couple of new clubs, sometimes even more than that. And then there's others that, that may fade away after a while if student interest uh, wanes uh, in, in certain areas. Uh, typically, those are proposed by students, and you see some of the, uh, after the scroll down here, you'll see um, a few of those qualifications, which include um, at least five active members. Uh, we need to have a staff advisor. Um, and then we have encouraged uh, the use of, or the utilization of a community service or school service component. Um, along with that, um, you see a few little other pieces there. Uh, as Trish mentioned, we really work hard at trying to prevent barriers for students to meet. So we do have some casual lunchtime clubs that will meet, like for example, on Wednesdays at the high school is our one day a week that we have a common lunch. Uh, the rest of the week, we have a, multi, a couple different lunch periods. And so we have some, um, a magic club that, that meets, a chess club that meets, an anime club that meets. Uh, they rarely, if ever, do anything outside of that lunch hour time. But then there's obviously the more, um, there's clubs that have weekend, they have competitions like Skills USA or FBLA um, and others. Um, another piece, just a little, little overview of, of how we, alert our students to what clubs are available. Um, the, our freshmen that just came in, we had um, all of our ninth graders watched a video uh, of all of the clubs that we have with those club advisors um, explaining uh, what the club is about, when they meet and um, how they meet. And then all ninth graders took a Google survey on clubs that would interest them that they wanted to know more about. Uh, coming up September 29th, we have a club fair. So we'll have all of our clubs represented out in the quad and um, students can then ask questions, interact with a lot of the student leaders uh, and advisors. Uh, jumping to, down to the second point there on club organization and approval, uh, we've added something new to that. They're used to, for their courses, the administration uh, approval that is, is a part of that. But the new piece is the student leadership being involved in that. And so um, our student leadership groups at our three schools will review all those applications so they can give feedback, um, they can give, uh, offer input or suggestions um, in terms of the club organization itself. Um, so anyway, that, that is uh, the club organizational approval process and then ultimately administration would um, approve that. Uh, then uh, jumping to the third bullet there, parent notification. This is also something um, that we've kind of added a layer uh, in there. And with that, um, parents are going to be alerted uh, following this uh, board meeting uh, three different ways. We'll have an email that will go out that will, uh, these, all the clubs you see listed here for both North, South, and the Grants Pass High, we will be alerting our, our uh, parents of all the different club opportunities that students can participate in. That will also be posted on our website, and South Middle School already has a uh, great looking website that, that demonstrates uh, their clubs and our club application um, and review. And there you see it there, their, their website. And then uh, lastly, we'll also put it in the student parent handbook. So it'll be listed there also. If a new club was to be added during the year, so let's say in January, some kids came back after the break and wanted to share uh, or wanted to offer a new club, then we would notify parents of that. Um, ultimately, what we would do, and I think actually, Trisha, you're going to get into a little bit of the, um, yeah. the parent notification. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, anyway, those are, those are just a few ways we're notifying parents, and then parents um, will then have the ability to uh, give permission um, or not give permission um, once they're notified. Back to the guidelines. Tommy's going to take us on to number four on the club guidelines. I know we're having some technical difficulties. I just want to acknowledge that for everybody on um, the district office is having some internet connection issues. So appreciate your patience, everybody. So Tommy. just real quick, Trish, can I just clarify? Because mine went down entirely as the host. Is, can you see the screen now that's being shared? We, we can. Thanks okay. for having it on number four. Yep. OK. Tommy. Tommy Blanchard, principal at North Middle School. Uh, before I share a little bit about number four and five, uh, we know that kids have been out so long and lacking connection to school and lacking peer-to-peer uh, -peer connections. And so it is really important that we explore opportunities 
for kids outside of what have traditionally been the most common, uh, particularly the middle school, which is athletics and music. And so we're hungry to provide new opportunities for students, but we need to make sure we have parameters around that, both for kids and starting a club, as well as for advisors. And so we're super excited to be able to share this information with you tonight. Ryan talked about a number of things, and I'm going to talk about the organization and the meetings. Uh, we are going to make sure that all meetings are scheduled in advance. There will always be a staff member there, and they will always be approved by an administrator. There will be no sneak meetings. There will not be anything that's not done without notification and approval by our administration. We will not be interrupting class activities for any of the clubs. We're a little bit different at the middle, two middle schools than the high school that uh, anything that we do will primarily be after school, uh, possibly before school, but primarily after school with three different lunches. We don't have the ability to have an advisor available for three straight periods. So we are looking at uh, primarily afternoon things, but back to the point that we will not be interrupting classes to do that. We do wanna make sure that um, it's orderly and that it uh, stays civilized for all meetings. Uh, we'll never uh, be breaking any laws in anything that we do, nor will we encourage anybody to come in that would be doing so. We also have a plan in place to uh, allow parents to visit. Um, these are student run clubs. And so in order to have visitors come, um, so primarily with parents right now, there needs to be advance notice to the advisor and the club. So the club is aware that a parent would be coming, but we certainly welcome parents to, to be in the know and a part of what's going on. Um, in the event that we have someone that wants to visit that is not a parent, um, then club leadership, uh, that would be student in conjunction with the advisor, uh, would uh, alert the uh, members of the club, have a conversation about it that could include administration and um, more than likely um, for all intents and purposes a visitor would be allowed to come and sit in and learn about what's going on in the club if we were to have routine multiple visits by someone outside of the club then we would make sure that they follow through with the same expectations that we do for um, staff at school in terms of um, background checks and vaccine mandates, uh, similar to what we have to do with our all other volunteers, including our PTSA at this point in time. So we, um, we're, we're making sure that administration is very much in the know, has to approve things, uh, want parents to be involved as much as possible. And there is the possibility of having uh, guests come and learn a little bit about the club. When it comes to club activities, um, there's oftentimes uh, an effort to try to advertise for the club. Um, and that also will have to be approved. And anything that goes up in terms of poster advertisement must be approved and officially stamped by administration before it goes up. Our club members could also um, have announcements made over the intercom, um, bulletin boards, but again, all of those would be approved prior to by administration before that was allowed. In the event that one of the clubs wants to have some kind of other social media presence, then they will work with our district communication specialist um, to uh, pursue that possibility there. Any type of fundraiser, um, expenditures, any type of field trips, uh, all of those, again, I think the common theme you're hearing is that it has to be approved by administration. Any type of field trip, uh, there would be both parent notification and permission required. And then any use of our facilities, whether before school, after school, would always need to be approved by our administrative team. Thank you. I uh, just got word that Robert Lingo's internet is down at South Middle School, and I am hearing issues that we're still having uh, internet connection issues at the district office. Todd, are you still there? I am. I'm in and out. It looks like the board chair got kicked out. Uh, superintendent's not been able to get on. Um, and I'm on. And I'm going to go on to number six. I don't know. Thank you. I appreciate you scrolling. Um, should we go ahead and continue or how do you? Well, 
Mochi, um, I think they're trying to figure out if we can have a meeting with these conditions or not. Everybody keeps getting kicked off. So we might be having a district problem or something in the area, I'm not sure. I'll go ahead and keep talking about yeah, number six, seven, and eight. And if Robert gets back on, I'm hoping he will, he'll be able to um, speak to it. One of the things uh, we mentioned earlier is we wanna have some accountability for clubs and organizations. So we are gonna ask them to provide an annual report. In that report, it's a copy of it is in your packet. We don't need to scroll to that. Basically, they would say how many meetings they had, what kinds of um, activities they did, and uh, how many members participated. We will, we do have the right, and we're making sure that there's notice of this as administration to dissolve a club. Um, some of the reasons are listed there on why a club would be dissolved. And then uh, particular penalties might also apply to some clubs based on their failure to adhere to board policies. And so wanting to put that accountability piece in as well. Todd, if you scroll all the way down to club advisor roles and responsibilities. In this section, this is intended for our um, adults, uh, who, our staff members to make sure that it's clear that these are student led organizations. Um, they are there to help support and provide some direction. Um, sorry, it's not coming up on the screen. So let me go to my notes here. We also have a process for staff. Uh, it's in order for compensation to occur for clubs and organizations. Um, it would have to go through our labor management committee first um, in order to be added to our extra duty contract schedule. We gave some examples of some guidelines, general guidelines. The labor management committee will be uh, looking at those and making determinations as new clubs come forward but wanted to establish that there will be a process for that. Um, so back to the, the website and parent notification, I know Todd showed you already, but the um, couple of things we have planned um, this week, we'll be sending out a parent square notification to all of our parents, notifying them of the clubs and organizations in that parent square notification. Parents will have the ability to opt out of particular clubs if they don't want their student to participate. That's also posted on the website um, that you saw earlier when we were able to share our screen. Um, and that will live out there all year so that as a new club gets um, formed, there will be notice of it. We'll also be adding it to our student parent handbooks. Uh, obviously we already printed those for this year. So we'll be doing different communication means. If any new clubs or organizations get added this year, our plan would be to use Parent Square to notify parents and to give them that opportunity to opt out of it. Um, there's another page to scroll down to, but I'm gonna ask um, for current clubs and student organizations. I think it's important that um, each one of our schools be able to highlight some of the clubs they have currently going on at their school and some of the good things that those uh, clubs have done. You'll see at the top of this, this was put together as a board summary. Um, if you go out to the website, South Middle Schools, for example, and you click on the name of the club, it actually gives you the description of the club. So there's more information about what that club is and, and what it um, does that a parent or student could refer to and determine if that's a club they would be interested in joining. We're asking schools also to keep historical information for, for our reference. Um, we're gonna start off with Ryan um, talking about the clubs at Grants Pass High School. And Ryan, I don't know if you've already touched on um, your student listening session and the importance of clubs and organizations to your student body. No, uh, I know several board members participated just was it a week or two ago in a listening session um, where we had um, students invited, uh, only one that was actually there, but gave some really good feedback as to just the meaning of being able to have clubs in which they could participate, that they had um, a safe place to go. Um, as you can tell there from the list, there's common interests is what bring those students together. And just like the band does that, just like our volleyball and soccer and 
football teams, et cetera, do that for students. Uh, mock trial does that. Poetry club does that. Origami, et cetera, uh, does that. And uh, just a lot of pride. I, one of the things we really try and highlight with our students and parents is the number of different clubs that are offered. Um, it, what I forgot to mention too is that our eighth grade parent night in typical years, um, we, we also have all of our clubs uh, represented there too, just so our parents and students can see those, at, go to visit at the table, see what kind of activities they offer. Uh, a club that I'll just choose to highlight at the moment is our key club, uh, as well as our Zonta or Z club. Um, couple of those. And then we also have an interact club. Those are all service clubs. And I know some of our board members are you are you're you indeed yourselves are involved in service clubs. Uh, we do have they each of those clubs has liaisons in the community that they correspond with. But uh, shout out, I know our recently retired teacher, Sean Gross, um, and now our new uh, teacher advisor, Alicia Morales, uh, is now our key club advisor. They've done a great job of recruiting and coming up with activities that any student can be a part of. Um, they may volunteer out in the cornfields there at the pumpkin patch um, several weekends during the fall. They may go to the elementary schools and do some student art along the, on the playground with kids. They do a number of different activities and our kids are able to, those are resume builders and just a real strength for our whole school and community. The Z Club also um, did a couple years ago, they got a, a $10,000 grant and funded uh, the feminine products that we're gonna be, utilize, be able to utilize in all our middle and high schools. And just a great, great job by those service clubs. So those are some that we'll highlight at Grants Pass High School. Tommy. I'm gonna highlight two of our clubs. Uh, the first one is our Brain Bowl team. And I, I'm highlighting that because it's a, uh, popular at both of the two middle schools. It's a pretty neat event where a number of kids come together in a, a Jeopardy type format and compete against other schools across Southern Oregon. Uh, it's really neat to see some kids provided opportunities to, to be in front of other kids and showcase the skills that they have. Um, and we've seen a lot of success. In fact, South, I think two years running has been uh, the Southern Oregon champion. So uh, that's really cool. The other one I'm gonna talk about is robotics. And the reason I am is because it's hot right now. We, um, we just opened it up last week on Wednesday and currently going through tryouts. We have a wonderful problem on our hands that in just a matter of a week, we've had almost 60 applicants for about 20 or 25 spots. And so it's been, need to see the kids and families outside uh, being super excited for their first opportunity. And a number of them are sixth graders and this is you know, only week two and yet they're really excited about something other than just uh, math and language arts. And so we're super excited. It's been a great way to connect with them. Um, we hope down the road um, that we'll be able to have more supplies on hand and additional coaches to be able to open it up to everyone possible. But um, we're working through that right now and really proud of Bethany Knoll and the work that she has done um, to put a really great program together. She also works in conjunction with Chris Gelderts, who um, runs uh, multiple robotics courses during the day, some intro courses for sixth grade, and then some more advanced one for our seventh and eighth grade students. Thank you. And I do think Robert Lingo was able to get back on. Robert, you want to share a little bit about some of South's clubs? And maybe his internet's unstable. Give me a second to unmute him. <laughs> oh, sorry. Just moving around. I know. All right, try that now, Robert. Oh, there we go. Thank, thank you for your patience. It's kind of been the life out here at South with our construction and stuff. So I'm not not sure what happened to our internet this evening, but um, I know Trish got to talk about the the procedures we'll use kind of at the end of the year to wrap up and check on in our club. So thanks for doing that piece for me, Trish. But um, like Tommy said, the, one of the clubs that we're really excited about at South has been our Rainbow Club. Carly Nelson's done a great job with that the last few years. Um, 
getting lots of folks out to participate in that. Um, and then, the, you know, they meet routinely after school and, and put in a lot of hours of practice. And, and so they've done a great job um, over the last few years um, just being successful. But like Tommy said, I think with what we've experienced in COVID, just, just the opportunity to have these clubs available for kids to have an activity outside of the classroom is important for connections and, and building and reconnecting on some of those relationships. Um, we've had a pretty active chess club the last few years as well. One of our classified staff, Joel Wilder, has taken that on. Um, and so once or twice a month, for about 10 or 15 kids will meet in the library. And, and some of them were, are novices and they just kind of learn how to play chess. And some of them are experienced and, and have some really good matches against each other. So um, something we've talked about with that club is extending it so that they can start um, going to some chess competitions. He did a, a couple of those the very first year. And then last year, we didn't get to, to take kids out and do that, but we're hoping to get that club going again and being active and then um, getting out in competition. So, um, you know, all these clubs are run by staff often without a whole lot of a stipend. Um, and so we appreciate the time and effort they're, they're spending with kids to get them connected to school in a way outside of the classroom and things that interest them. So thank you. Thanks, Robert. And that is our uh, giving some more information about clubs. Are there any questions or anything we can answer for you today? Uh, Member Brownell, I just uh, was curious as to what the qualifications for getting a stipend on the various clubs was, what kind of um, processes. So on the club guidelines, you saw at, we're going to, as we add more clubs, um, we'll take it forward to the LMC. And you see in the guidelines, we're looking for uh, certain parameters about it. And it's really kind of about what's the workload how many students are part of the club? How many hours does it take? What kind of outside work are you doing? Some of our clubs, as you heard mentioned, actually are literally just, the, it's the teacher opening up their classroom during their lunch and kids are coming in and, and playing games. And, and that that's a much different thing than what Ryan described as the key club, which is a lot more work or honor society, which has uh, the advisors do a lot, a lot more work. So. When we take those things forward to Labor Management Committee to discuss, um, we'll kind of work on those parameters further. Does that help clarify your question, Debbie? Yes, thank you. Uh huh. I'd like to say that I appreciate the um, the level of clubs and stuff that the district is able to make available to the kids. We know that those extracurricular activities are those things that keep the students engaged for some of them. And they're very important to our graduation rates and things like that. Um, the only thing in the presentation that wasn't really clear to me as, um, as your kids get older, you let them make more and more of their decisions themselves. And you start, you go from helping them select what they're doing to sort of just monitoring what they're doing. Is there a way for the parents as they're moving through that continuum to the monitoring stage, just to know what clubs they're in? If they're not, you know, essentially going down to the school to find out. One of the things we're looking at doing, um, but it, we have quite a bit on the programming list right now. If you were to pull up a student in power school, you'll see a flag on the student that says um, it's a GP symbol. And those are students who are participating in athletics. And so a parent can log in and say, oh, my son's a football player, or my son's a, a, um, a wrestler, or my daughter plays basketball. And so a parent can see that on the flag. What we're hoping to develop over the next couple of months is a flag for clubs and organizations as well. Um, it's gonna take some time to get that in place, but our hope would be that one of the issues we're struggling with is clubs tend to be fluid. Uh, for some students, they'll show up to the game, um, the chess club for a couple of weeks, and then they'll change their mind and wanna try a different club. Um, 
So we're trying to figure out systems to help kind of monitor the clerical work, if you will, of, of that flag. But we have been in discussion about how that flag would be um, set and something visible for parents. It's not in place yet, but it is a part of our conversation. So what we put into our guidelines was um, that you know, parents being welcome to come visit, be a part of the club, um, see what the clubs are doing, um, the parent notification bits about what the different clubs and organizations on campus are, those kinds of things. So that, that's, that's, great. that's our plan solution. And, and automation is always good. It does take manpower, a lot of manpower. So hand up by Todd. Go ahead and speak, Todd. Uh, yeah, Member Neville here, and just wanted to say kudos on providing so many different options for those after school clubs. My two sons were involved in chess back in the day, and we travel with them. And so to see that there's opportunities for field trips. Uh, so, speaking of something like chess, let's say a, a child from north where chess doesn't look like it's a club option would want to participate in chess, would they be able to travel or participate with the South's chess club, so to speak? Good question. Who is that talking? Todd. Oh, Todd. Um, we are, so that's a, um, that is a problem we're tackling, not a problem. A, a, we're starting trying to problem solve that because as you know, GP Flex, for example, is a new school that we have. Um, and we want GP Flex students to be connected to their schools. And so how does a student from one school participate in another? Um, we don't have the logistics of that figured out, obviously transportation and timing. If the club's gonna meet right after school, but how do I get a student from North over to South to be in, and what if they meet during lunch? I mean, so there's all those kinds of factors, but we are looking at how um, like GP Flex students or even Gladiola students can participate in Grants Pass High School clubs. I'm glad you're thinking towards that end. Thank you. And then one last question follow up would be and kind of along the same lines of what Gary was talking about. I understand that the parents can find out what clubs their children are in. Is there any scenario where a child can join a club and not have a parent know that? I, I'm I'm just trying to think of the logistics, Ryan or Tommy or Robert, do you have some thoughts in terms of how, I mean, we have kids all the time that can, that, you know, you talk, you see um, uh, Danny in executive session talk about expulsion. So we have kids make decisions all the time that we don't necessarily uh, have a control over. So um, we work really hard to manage that to the extent possible, Todd, but to, to say that it's absolutely foolproof, I mean, nothing is foolproof. To, yeah, Ryan I'm, or Tommy, anything to add? Yeah, I think, um, you know, our after, we're excited about offering after school transportation this year. That's gonna, we'll, we're submitting lists of, of uh, with the students who have requested that to transportation. And I think like what Trish was saying is it just takes a lot of parent, parent asking. So. Um, if they could they go to a chess club at lunch hour and the parent not know yes that is absolutely possible if they want to hide that they're going to chess club at lunch yes. I, I don't know that the parent would necessarily um, be able to determine that but if it's an after school club honey where were you at at four o'clock today uh, you're always home off the bus at that, that time um, so it is po it is certainly possible and um, but but we do work hard as Trish said to try to make sure that those lists are updated and notified and once power schools up and we can actually indicate that when we with those little markers then that will be another positive step in that direction yeah and i get it that as parents the older our kids get the more decisions we want them to make without our involvement or control factor i get that uh, we're talking children from the ages of 10 or 11 clear up to 18 or 19 so right. uh, just a little concerning if my child was participating in something at the younger ages, and I was not able to know that until well into the attendance of such. But thank you for giving us opportunities of parents to ask and find out. For the middle school, and I don't know if Tommy was kicked off or not, but um, 
we we know that for a student to stay after school for clubs, there's going to have to be, and he as he shared with you, clubs are going to have to meet after school. So there will be parent notification that says your child is staying after school for clubs. So yes, again, though, I just, you know, kids are kids and we will, we try to the best of our ability. Yes, I would thank you. We're also going to really, really um, promote the parent being involved and responding to the parent square that goes out because our club advisors will have to monitor who, um, which families do not want their kids to attend. And so um, a, a parent, we know that not all parents are involved as maybe some of the parents sitting in this meeting, but we're gonna highly encourage and continue to promote uh, parents responding to that. So there is good communication between home and school. Richard Nelson, I do have, uh... member de Lagrange, um, I'll just ask a question while Todd's coming back. Um, um, so part of it says parents of club members must or may visit club meetings activities at any time, which is which is great. Um, but then it goes into, you know, they need to notify the club advisor and or leader prior to the visit to ensure all club members have been notified. Um, I'm just looking for staff's opinion on that is is would it be wise to have like a minimum time in there like 24 hours ahead of time or 48 hours uh, because I could foresee maybe a scenario where a parent's wanting to get in last minute and they're saying well I notified and but it's not you know it's all kind of rushed and maybe not all the members are notified so I just wanted to throw that out there. I can totally appreciate that I will make that adjustment to the guidelines thanks. Any other questions? I have one more question. Um, with regards to uh, guests that are not parents coming to clubs, am I reading correctly that the club essentially needs to approve a non-parent visitor? Is that, is that, am I reading that right? Correct. Okay, thank you. I think, I think Todd, for those that are on and can actually hear me, I think that our um, host and um, our district office where a lot of this is happening um, is still having technical difficulties. Appreciate your patience with us. I think Todd was saying that when he cut off that there was a few people that needed to speak to it, but he controls the, the he, he controls all of that. So. Scott, are you in the meeting? Nelson, Chairman. Ships adrift. I feel like it's that movie, movie Bueller. Bueller, anybody there? We're without our fearless Let's just leader. Be patient. Let's see if I can do some unmuting. Apparently somehow in this, I got, I got co-host responsibility. So I'm gonna see if I can unmute Scott. All Scott, right. I think can you're you unmuting. Me? Yeah. Thank you. So um, we are having significant challenges. Todd is texting me and letting me know that he can't stay in the meeting. Um, and so we're unable to unmute people or really, I, I don't know how we can continue. I don't know if our board members who are at the district offices, if they're on still or not. I think they've, we've lost at least two of our board members because of the technical challenges. So, um, 
I mean, honestly, I think because we're having so many issues, we may have to cancel the rest of the agenda and we'll have to come back. I don't know. Let me, um, I mean, I don't know what else to do. We have lost, we have lost our district office and Todd who's running the meeting from there. So, and we've lost two of our board members and our superintendent. Hold on a second. I'm going to try to unmute some people here that are texting me and ask is, uh, hold on. I got unmuted. Thank you, Trish. Yeah, Sorry. we have oh. no, we have significant challenges in popping in and out. I don't know how long this connection will be stable. I moved over to my laptop um, because it's already gone in and out several times. It is my recommendation right now um, that we um, postpone the, the remainder of the agenda. Um, because we do have at least two board members who do not have a capacity to vote. I can pass my laptop around if we wanna get through at least uh, the regular session um, and then attempt an executive session. Dr. Nelson, it's, it's pretty, pretty bad down here. I can definitely tell that Cassie and Cliff are back on. Uh, I can hear the echo through my wall. Um, so we can attempt to proceed um, but it would be my recommendation we postpone and get our issues fixed if we do, if we can't get there. So is Todd able to get back on and at least show us the agenda? I mean, I, I agree we are having some significant challenges here. So yeah, I just got back in again as the host. So this is a very strange experience. <laughs> I can try to share the screen again. Well, I think as long as we're here, if we have our two other board members, I'm happy to proceed as long as we can, um, recognizing that we may not be able to finish. But if everyone is back, do we have our two board members in the room? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, well, let's, uh, let's try to proceed as best we can. And if it continues to glitch out, then we may have to, to um, postpone the rest of the agenda. But so Todd, you were saying there was someone who'd like to speak to 4.1, is that right? Yeah, yes, yeah, sorry, Holly, if you're still out there, I'll try to find you again on the list. Um, you asked it. Well, this is super fun, bouncing in and out. Um, it just turned on and off again, that's awesome. I had to find Holly again. So All right, Holly, I've asked you to unmute. If you can, you, you can. Yeah, talk. are you able to hear me? I am, yes, go as fast as you can. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, I'll, I'll go fast. First, I'd like to uh, compliment you on the clubs that you have. I think that's fantastic. I think that's excellent for kids. Um, I, I will say I'm a little bit concerned about kind of a systematic uh, program of eliminating parents from the decision making process with their kids. And I, I have heard a few minutes ago that you are um, notifying parents and I think that's very important. I think these clubs, I was a gymnast from the time I was walking practically until I got into college. And I can tell you that it has a great uh, effect on your body. Parents need to weigh in on the physical activities of their kids and also the mental activities of their kids. So I'm hoping that you will um, make it mandatory that parents are notified when kids are in clubs or in sports. Are you still able to hear me? Yes, we are. Yep, we are, thank you. That's it, thank you. Um, was there any other comments, Todd? Uh, not for clubs, nope. The next one are, is for uh, special concerns and then 7.1 and then the 10.1s uh, and up series. Okay. Um, well, then we'll go to 4.2, our summer school report with uh, directors Atola and Evans. I am not sure Susan is on. I think her internet is down. Yep, she's not on. So I'm going to attempt this. 
Um, I'll be very brief. You have the data in your packet. Um, as you know, we were given significant dollars uh, for summer school. I'm hoping Sherry is on and can give you the total amount spent on summer um, sessions this year. Uh, we really ramped up our efforts, um, most notably at elementary and middle school. You see the elementary data here in front of you. We did a, we had a lot of partnerships, um, community partnerships. I know that Josephine County uh, Foundation worked quite a bit with elementary and middle school, um, as did, um, and forgive me for not remembering the name, um, we, we partnered with Camp Eek, but we also, um, Amy Harbolt's uh, daycare provided quite a significant amount of support to us as well. Jill Gove, a huge shout out to her for her organizational capacity and what she was able to pull off with 308 students participating. 308 uh, elementary students participating um, in our various uh, summer sessions. So just wanted to tell me he needs me I, to get some forms. Sorry. Um, Todd, if you, I'm sorry, I don't have more information on elementary, but you see the data there and we are super proud of what we were able to accomplish. Middle school. Um, oh, Trish. So, hang on a second. We oh, got, I got Susan here. She can talk. We don't have video, but that's great for me. <laughs> so I uh, thank you for um, calling out um, in a great way, Jill Go. She was our co on-site coordinator for elementary summer school and it absolutely would not have happened without her. Um, just real briefly again, because you do have it um, in front of you, but we were able to serve 338 students who attended at least one camp. Many of those students attended multiple camps, but 338 different elementary students attended at least one. That included um, eight weeks of summer camps at Parkside with 56 different classes to choose from. We also partnered with Wildlife Images and supported students who wanted to participate in Camp Eek, which um, was out at Wildlife Images. We had an orchestra camp um, up at the high school, I believe it was, and then again, the camps at um, Parkside. So we also had on-site childcare before and after those eight weeks of summer camp for uh, working families to help facilitate their schedules and we provided transportation after camps if needed. So we learned a lot. Uh, there are, you know, a few things, obviously, every time you do something for the first time that you will revise and uh, make better for the next time. But all in all, we feel like it was a huge success and um, a great opportunity for our students. I don't see that the middle school summary actually made it into your board packet. Um, we did a lot of different things at the middle school um, as well. One thing I've just, uh, the data is in front of you, but I'll, I'll say um, I know elementary experienced the same problem we did at middle school. A lot of parents registered. Um, it was a free summer session. Um, our camps filled up very quickly and then we had a lot of people not show up. It was extremely disappointing to have uh, a number of students on the wait list that we were not able to have join us because of late notice and um, parents just deciding not to um, have their student join. We also had to camp cancel several middle school camps due to smoke. Um, our most popular camp, fish camp, did not get off the ground. Um, Ian McGregor had lots of good things planned for kids. Uh, but the smoke had to keep us indoors. We also canceled uh, our basketball tournaments because we didn't have enough participation. At the high school level, um, we had a number of students recovering credit. Um, the the uh, various camps um, in total had quite a few opportunities for students to recover some lost credit. We've always done the edgenuity things. Um, we didn't have very good turnout. That was more online, but some of our in-person stuff uh, was able to um, have students connect. That is our summer school report. Any questions about summer school? Oh, 
thank you. I know that my some of my children participated. They had a wonderful time, and we were very grateful for those opportunities for them. So I know uh, you have at least one grateful family, and I'm sure many others whose children did get to do a number of things. So Debbie, did you have a comment? I just wondered, it was mentioned that there might be a figure on how much we spent on summer school. I didn't know if that was, if Sherry's on or if that was. Yep. Hi, hi Debbie, this is Sherry. Hi. We spent um, about $436,000 on summer school this year. The majority of that was at, we spent the most at the elementary level. Okay. Well, and I know that there were, you know, many families that were grateful that they could get in and others that were disappointed because they couldn't get in. So it was, uh, was well received by the community. But thank you. This is member Wilkins. I would like to say thank you for, I know that that was probably a tremendous, not probably, it was a tremendous amount of work. Um, I would hope that our community, if it is something that's continued, would be consistent and showing up. Thank you. This is member Neville and I echo Chair Nelson's um, thankfulness for my own child being involved uh, in orchestra camp. So once again, kudos for extending those opportunities to kids during non-school time. And to the, the staff and teachers that were willing to go out of their box. It's important. All right, any other questions or comments? All right, well, thank you. Uh, we will go on to 5.0 board reports and special concerns. So I'll open up to the board. Uh, well, this is member Brownell and I'll just mention that um, Lois McMillan participated in a Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History online um, uh, talk on Robert F. Kennedy's report on civil rights. And I have the certificate to prove that I participated, but it was a wonderful um, program and very informative. And it was a pleasure to see her uh, shine on a national basis. Thank and you, Debbie. and I, I'd also rec highly recommend, um, I just finished reading uh, Ron Chernow's uh, biography of Washington. And it's kind of amazing to see the um, difficulties overcome at the beginning levels of our nation. And, and uh, they really, um, were many and hard and um, it was inspiring to see them overcome all those problems. <clears throat> Thanks, Debbie. Anyone else? Well, this Cliff, member Cliff, uh, my wife and I uh, took great pleasure in attending the opening uh, football game, home football game here at Fez High School last Friday, and it brought back so many wonderful memories of uh, what a beautiful uh, football stadium we have that uh, community gave to us. And uh, again, second to none in the state of Oregon and the way it's prepared and appears uh, to the spectator. Uh, all the people that came out to the game, I was amazed at the size of the crowd and uh, no, we didn't win the game, but in many ways we did win the game because it was good old fashioned football, caveman football, and we loved it. Thank you, Cliff. I think it's worth noting as well, member, uh, member Neville here, that the band took the field and delivered an outstanding performance 
and we had some children on that field. So thanks for those efforts of the band directors and all those involved with our children in sports as well as uh, other activities. All right. Well, we'll go on to 6.0 then, our superintendent's report. So, Kirk, I hope you're still with us. He needs to be unmuted. Todd, can you unmute our superintendent? He was yeah, just able to do that. We're scrambling. Yep, I got it. You got it. So while I do have a connection, uh, real quickly, uh, just briefly touch on reopening schools has been a tremendous success in spite of uh, new daily positive COVID cases or presumptive COVID cases. For example, yesterday we had 11, uh, including students and staff, resulting in another 23 individuals having to quarantine. So this is a day-to-day -day basis that we are going through these things numerous sports programs, et cetera, but we are keeping our doors open and we are keeping kids in school. So kudos to Sherry and our building administrators, our district office team. Uh, we got kids in school right where they need to be. There's a lot of excitement, uh, both in the classroom and the hallways. So uh, well done uh, to our district as we manage this day to day. Okay, any questions from the board members? Um, I just wondered how the uh, board retreat went last month. Board retreat? District office. The, the district office, yeah, I, yeah, sorry, district office. You um, mean our all administrator retreat in early yeah. August? Yes. Uh, tremendous success, uh, much needed, um, I guess you'd call it fellowship, laughter, uh, camaraderie uh, as we kicked off the new year. Lots of incredible energy coming out of that, focusing on uh, really much of what we discussed was focusing on the work we need to do moving forward. And it wasn't a lot of conversation about COVID. It's about uh, what the board talked about earlier is focusing uh, in our uh, workshop prior to this meeting, but focusing on the critical work that we need to do to advance student achievement and success for our students. So um, yeah, it was tremendous. And uh, we all felt rejuvenated and ready to tackle this new year. Right, thank you. This is member Wilkins. Is there any talk amongst the state or anything about losing kind of local control for us to decide what our own metrics are? No, great question, Cassie. Uh, I had a meeting this afternoon, statewide superintendents meeting. Uh, there's still a focused effort to uh, continue to allow as much local decision-making around when to quarantine, when to isolate, when to shut down schools, classrooms, et cetera. Still really leaving that upon us. Um, they did emphasize the governor and Salem's intention is they want kids in school. And they even said, you know, they gave a short blurb on short term distance learning and they really want districts to not have to go there they're really doing everything they can to prevent that so no indications thus far that there is going to be uh, further state mandates but we know how that wind blows week to week Any other questions for Kirk? Well, Kirk, I think I speak for the board. We're very grateful for the hard work that's been going on. Uh, we recognize the challenges that the district and the teachers and our staff have had to face as they open up and um, certainly the parents and the students as well. I think this is an extremely challenging time for everybody, but we are grateful that we do have the opportunity to go back even though it looks different, it certainly is better than just being stuck online. Um, and so to have the clubs up and running and have the opportunities for the kids to be back in school 
is a much better proposition than where we were last year. So uh, we're excited to see our numbers coming down and things to continue to improve, I hope. And uh, hopefully we can keep the kids where they need to be, which is in school. So thank you and your team for all the work. Uh, let's go to 7.0 then. Uh, action item 7.1, approval of third and final reading of policy IGDA student organizations. So we've heard about that this evening. Do we have a motion? Lagrange moves to approve. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second. Member Wilkins. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? Uh, Member Brownell, was uh, there something that was going to be added, or was that just for um, not in the policy itself, but in the implementation? So take a look at uh, your screen now. It should be visible. The teal colored highlight with the addition of the red text was added since the last board meeting. Yeah, I thought that looked, uh, this is Member Richardson, I thought that looked pretty good. Um, with the addition of that text, I'm not sure the word notified annually, uh, that the annually part applies, you could just strike the word annually and just say notified of clubs and organizations available to school. And then the, the annually sort of become uh, not useful. Understood, there's a motion to accept it as it is right now. If somebody wanted to modify that motion to um, eliminate the word annually and accept the text as it is. Um, you can move forward with that. Member Neville here. It's a small typo. Notice will done through the next sentence. We need to insert the word B. Thank you. So who, uh, this is Member Richardson who made the motion? Member D. LaGrange made the motion. Am I able to just uh, amend the motion with those two changes? I think we can do that. All right, then I move to do so. Oh, in second. <laughs> okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Any further comments? Very good, Tanya, can we have a roll call vote, please? Member De La Grange? Yes. Member Neville? Yes. Wilkins? Yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Brownell? Yes. Member Nelson? Yes. Member Coleman? Yes. All right. Well, a unanimous vote for our board. That's a novelty. Congratulations, everyone. I'm glad we found some common ground. So. Um, I'm sorry, Todd is just texting me. There is someone that wished to speak. Todd? Yep, we had Michael Haley who'd asked to address 7.1. So Michael, I'll, on my view here, ask you to unmute and you'll have three minutes. Can you hear me? I can't hear you, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, this was in reference to the um, Katie Metter to uh, Damiano, them being fired um, and the appeal. And I would like to encourage you to let them appeal. I think that it was very unfair. Um, there's a group of us in town who are forming an organization called FAIR that we're gonna start to uh, fight this. Um, we, we think it was wrong uh, for them to be fired. I think that they were just trying to help the girls and trying to deal with a very difficult issue. There needs to be a lot more community debate about this. Um, we have hooked up together with the national organization called FAIR, uh, Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, and we're gonna be working on this in the future. So that's my input for the, at this point. Thank you, Michael. And I apologize, Board Chair Nelson, I have, the, I have two mics on here. That was for the wrong one. So Michael, your comments are noted. And then I have a Michael Pelfrey who asked to talk about 7.1. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
excuse me, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. So here's what I would like to add. You know, we have a lot of discussion about these children and these students going back to school. However, and based on what you just said, you mentioned something about the governor really wanting students to attend school this year and, and hopefully not go through any more mandates. But we're actually in a mandate as we speak. And these kids are having to be math. And um, I'm seeing a lot of information. And, and right now, I'm not reading this locally. But I am seeing it in other parts of the country where there are school boards that are actually um, wanting to see students vaccinated. So what I would like to propose is I would like to propose that every school board member, as well as the superintendent, to go on record with the city of, well, should say the, the citizens of Grants Pass and our students. And I'd like you to go on record and actually state whether you would like to see students vaccinated in order to attend school or not. And I'd also like to hear about what you feel about our children wearing masks and not being able to see each other smile. And, you know, if you give a high five, what are they going to do, arrest you? You know, kids need to be able to enjoy, especially those kids that are starting high school, and what about those young men and women that are leaving high school this year? Do we want to see them go out of high school with the memory of wearing masks? I can not only imagine what the yearbook should look like. Thank you very much for your time. It's time to step up for the kids of Grants Pass. I'm out. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. All right, can we go back to the agenda? Todd. All right, so item 8.0 or future meeting dates and suggested uh, agenda items. Um, we have our board workshop on the 28th. Um, and then our next board meeting on the, on the 12th of October. And then you can see the future dates there. So um, are there any questions about our future meetings or um, workshops? Okay, very good. Well, we will adjourn our regular session and uh, we will give everyone a five minute break and we will open up our executive session here in uh, five minutes. So thank you everyone for your attendance. More than an hour. Notifying, notifying what your uh what you're voting on you know the uh the proposed policy is very discriminatory you guys are asking or, or telling people that the unvaccinated are more likely to infect uh, somebody versus the vaccinated which is absolutely untrue and it, based on cdc guidance there's a uh, a memo dated july 30th 2021 from the CDC that specific, specifically says the Delta infection resulted in similarly high uh, COVID viral loads in vaccinated and unvaccinated people. High viral loads suggest an increased risk in transmission and raise concerns that unlike other variants, vaccinated people infected with Delta, Delta can transmit the virus. You also have issues like the CDC and the FDA saying that People with beards cannot wear an N95. So are you going to require people with beards to shave their face so they can wear an N95? Um, I, uh, re I asked Kurt Cole about this, uh, this policy last week and he responded that the ODE and OHA are, are supportive of that guidance. I called them today and the ODE said they do not give out guidance for accommodations and they refer specifically to the OHA um, opening schools, safe learners, or uh, that, that statewide policy, which it doesn't say anything about that in there either. 30 seconds, Matt. Yeah. Hello? Can you hear me? Yep, you have about 25 seconds left. Okay. Um, <clears throat> instead of, uh, if you want to do an accommodation, why don't you uh, do something that helps everybody and put some Use some of this COVID money 
and uh, and put some air purifying machines in the classroom. You know, um, this is just an absolute uh, shame that this came from our district, not from the state. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So our item on the agenda is 12.0, 12.1, and 12.2, approval of certified MOAs and classified MOAs. So I will entertain a motion to approve those. I move we approve uh, item 12.1, approval of a certified MOAs and approval of classified MOAs under 12.2. Thank you. Do we have a second? Ravi Lagrange, second. Thank you. Any further discussion? I, I think it'd be appropriate to note that uh, we're going to, the district will send out additional communication to the employees related to clarification. Not that these MOAs are going to change, just that the district. Uh, wants to be sure that everybody understands the real intent of the MOAs. Thank you, Member Richardson. I agree. I think <clears throat> there has been a lot of discussion regards to this prior to and also during the executive session. I think a number of concerns that the public has were raised and answered, and we would invite you to speak with um, our district administrators if you have further questions. But I think um, I think all of the questions were asked and answered during our executive session. So uh, any other comments or questions or concerns with regards to the MOAs and the motion on the floor? All right, well, Tanya, would you give us a roll call vote, please? Tanya, did you make it back? It's too many mutes and unmutes, so I'll start at the beginning. Member De La Grange? Yes. Member Neville? Yes. Member Wilkins? No. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Brownell? Yes. Member Nelson? Yes. Member Coleman? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. The motion passes. And uh, we will conclude our meeting for this evening and we will readjourn in two weeks. Thank you very much, everyone, for your attendance. Have a good night. Good night. Yay. Uh,